Hello and welcome back to The Long Short. I'm your host, Tom Kill. Well, I trust you all had a good summer. Drew is taking a well-deserved break and will be out for the next couple of weeks soaking up the last bit of summer. Well, it's been a busy time since we last spoke to you, especially in the US. Regular listeners will remember our conversations earlier in the year with Daniel Austin, AIMA's Head of US Markets Policy and Regulation. The guy keeping a close watch on everything happening on Capitol Hill. We last caught up with Daniel in the spring, right in the middle of some major regulatory upheaval for the asset management industry and AIMA's involvement in several legal challenges against the US SEC, including the private fund advisor rule. So what better time then than to bring Daniel back onto the podcast and get the very latest update from DC. Daniel, welcome back to The Long Short. Thanks, Tom. Good to be back with you all. I hope you had a good summer. Was it a little less hectic than last year's whirlwind? It was a little bit less hectic. We were uh, busy, as, as we'll discuss here in a few minutes, uh, handling a variety of uh, litigation-related uh, initiatives, I'll put it that way, uh, but not as uh, busy on the rulemaking front as we have been, certainly since the, the end of 2021 and into 2022. Now, just this past week, AIMA published its latest government and regulatory affairs newsletter that it puts out to its members every month. One thing that stood out to me was the notable absence of any reference or update on the private fund advisor rule. So, Daniel, is the saga finally over? It is officially over, Tom. Happy to report that. Uh, just to recap the timeline a bit for for listeners. So oral argument in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals took place on February 5th. The decision was issued by the panel on June 5th. And then the SEC then had until July 22nd to request a rehearing by the same panel or an en banc hearing, which is essentially all of the judges on the uh, Court of Appeals in the Fifth Circuit Mm -hmm. to hear that case. That deadline passed. And then on July 29th, the court issued the mandate which officially strikes down the rule. And we th- that's not necessarily the end. The SEC had until September 3rd to right. petition the Supreme Court for a writ of certiorari to hear the case. Uh, they did not file that petition. So as of September 3rd, the rule is officially dead and gone. However, it still remains on the SEC's website. Um, right. I would anticipate that at some point that will, will come down uh, in due course. Interesting. Now, earlier in the summer, we spoke to Nick Morgan, a good friend of AMA, Nick Morgan of ICANN. He told our listeners about the overturning of the landmark Chevron doctrine and the ramifications for any reprisal of PFAR. And those of you who want to listen back to the conversation, please go to episode 87 of the Long Short. But Daniel, how significant is this change and can you quickly remind our listeners about this very important development sure i'll I'll give you a brief background so the chevron decision is a 1984 supreme court decision really serve almost as kind of a cornerstone of administrative law in the u.s and with that decision uh, the chevron case instructed courts to defer to a federal agency's interpretation of ambiguous language and statutes so Mm -hmm. if congress passed a law and it directed an agency, for example, the SEC, to implement certain rules uh, under the law. If the SEC adopted rules that were deemed uh, ambiguous or the language in the statute was ambiguous and there was a challenge to that statute or to that regulation, the court had to defer to the agency's reasonable interpretation of that ambiguous statute. So now that is no longer the case post Loper Bright. Um, and I think what we're going to see now is uh, as agencies act or engage in uh, formal rulemaking activity, they're going to be much more cautious and engage in th- more thorough economic analysis and really question uh, and analyze whether a statute could be deemed ambiguous and whether what they are proposing or adopting. Um, from a rulemaking standpoint is consistent with that statute. So interestingly, I think this has you know, myriad implications on the regulatory state in the United States. Mm-hmm. So this could perhaps increase litigation 
uh, against federal agencies. Um, you would think that maybe industries or associations could be more emboldened to challenge a rule, whereas they otherwise may not have prior been uh, as confident to bring that challenge uh, prior to the Loper Bright decision. Yeah, and, and, and the point being made here is this is not unique to the SEC. This is for all government agencies in the right. US. Yeah. Right. I mean, um, this has a, a big impact beyond just the one that, that we talk about the most here, Tom, the SEC, that's the Federal Trade Commission, which has had a number of its rules challenged in court lately, uh, could be the admin, uh, the EPA, which issues uh, environment-related uh, rules and regulations. So this really has a very significant uh, impact on the, the future of regulation in the U.S. And then it also does kind of flow into for Congress as they write legislation, whether they're going to try to be more specific um, and try to, you know, have more, I guess, subject matter expertise as they write about a subject that may be quite complicated where they in the past they were deferring to the agency's expertise to kind of promulgate rules consistent with the statute. Now it may be uh, more incumbent upon Congress and the uh, folks holding the pen to uh, be a bit more specific with what they put into a law. Yeah, I'm bringing this full circle then, the view that you expressed and, and, and the result of PFAR on the 5th of June, as I understand it, the court vacated the entire rule, so right. no part of it can stand. And, and the Chevron Doctrine then obviously has a big part in that, and that it cannot be PFAR that is, in its previous form, cannot be put out in the same way. Is that correct? So if the SEC wanted to, so the, the court ruling, that to, to give a, a bit of a background, the SEC mm -hmm. and the private funds rule, <coughs> excuse me, really relied on two specific uh, rules in the Advisors Act, so 206 and then 211H. The Fifth Circuit panel more or less said that 211H, which is entitled Other Matters, does not include private funds. Private funds are not within scope of that section. And then 206 right. is the anti-fraud authority that the SEC has. So if the SEC wanted to promulgate perhaps a new rule where they try to you know, make some of the changes that they made in the private funds rule, they can't do that under 211H right. because the court was pretty emphatic that private fund advisors are not the subject of that section and the SEC does not have authority over private funds per that section. Um, what we are seeing is and I think what industry and, and Miami colleagues have kind of observed since then is there has been a change in terms of the, uh, I guess, focus perhaps of the exam staff um, as they go in and examine you know, our members and, and over the past few months since PFAR that despite PFAR being struck down, there's still going to be a focus on some of those core pieces of PFAR, whether it's, um, you know, uh, kind of the restricted activities part or whether it's preferential treatment or, or otherwise, uh, we imagine that and anticipate that there will be more of a focus through that lens rather than having a rule out there that really prescribes, uh, you know, some very significant uh, burdens on the, on the uh, industry. Right. Okay. Well, that's very helpful to get that clarity. Uh, Daniel, when we last spoke to you, as Drew and I spoke to you, it was in February, I think it was, and you talked about two other legal challenges that AMA was taking forward, namely proposals to change the long-standing dealer rule and the short selling and securities lending rules. What developments can you tell our listeners about those? Right. So since since February, uh, the briefings in both of those cases have been completed. Um, I'll start with the securities lending and then short sell rules since that litigation sure. was initiated uh, first uh, last fall. Um, or I guess it was last December by now. The that rule challenges both the securities lending and short sale rules that were adopted during the same open meeting uh, back in October of last year although they both kind of deal with the same underlying transaction in, in other words, short sales, 
they contemplate and adopt two separate reporting and disclosure frameworks for those transactions. And we believe that those that's entirely, entirely arbitrary and capricious. Um, that case is proceeding in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, like I said, the briefings have been completed there and oral argument is set for October 7th. Um, I'll be attending that in person, so look forward to, to seeing that uh, live. Um, and we anticipate that we'll likely have a decision there uh, in Q1 or Q2 of next year. And there are a number of factors that go into the timing of when there's a decision. It can be anything from uh, the makeup of the three judges hearing the case, uh, whichever judge is assigned to write the opinion. And then, of course, um, whether the opinion is unanimous or it's a 2-1 decision, either way, it just depends. Um, so that's short selling and second lending. The other case, Tom, that you mentioned is the dealer rule, which yeah. I know I've talked about several times uh, with you and Drew. And that rule or that litigation, the briefing there, scheduled briefing at least, is, has been completed. That's proceeding in the District Court of Appeals in the Northern District of Texas in Fort Worth. And that's going through, has been initiated at a different, I guess, stage of or level of the court system because of the statutory language under which that rule was adopted. This case went straight to the District Court as opposed to the Appeals Court, like SEC Lending Short Sale or PFAR. So the dealer case has been completed, the briefings uh, have been completed, and now we're waiting for a decision. We anticipate that the judge there could issue a decision by the beginning of, of December. Right. And then after that point, depending on which way the uh, judge decides, either you know ourselves and industry or the SEC will have the option to um, appeal to the Fifth Circuit. Right, okay, interesting, okay. so. More, more developments soon. Um, but are there any other are there any other issues outstanding? Uh, talk to me a little bit about the advocacy efforts that AIM has been working on since we spoke in in February. Um, obviously, notwithstanding the development around PFAR, but in the newsletter that we talked about earlier, this the monthly newsletter for September, you referenced that the SEC has finalised two new rules and they set to finalize another imminently. So what can you tell our listeners about this? So the day of this recording, September 18th, the SEC did adopt changes to the tick size regime and also exchange access fees. Um, I think the adoption of these rules recently does signal um, upcoming and additional action by the commission. Uh, Gary Gensler is one to finish what he starts or either attempt to finish what he starts. And with seven weeks until the presidential election here in the U.S., where we may see a change in the administration to uh, or uh, the party of the Republicans, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, the end of a Gensler tenure come next January, Inauguration Day, uh, I anticipate that, that he'll be on the march, so to speak, and try to get through some of these rules that, that are still outstanding, many of which are still incredibly impactful. We're waiting on... Mm -hmm rule for outsourcing, cybersecurity, um, a change to reg ATS and uh, government ATSs, which is a big one for on the market side of things. We understand that it's likely that the custody or safeguarding rule and the predicted data analytics rule will likely be reproposed. Um, we've been waiting on that reproposal um, for months now. It seems like it's been imminent for months, but I think in the wake of the PFAR decision and the Fifth Circuit panel really in their view, defining what 206 and 211H mean, the SEC's had to probably go back to the drawing board um, and reconsider how it includes private funds within the scope of, of those rules. So elsewhere on the SEC side of things, <clears throat> personally, I've been working a good bit on treasury clearing related uh, items. Uh, last December, the SEC adopted a rule that requires that <clears throat> Uh, all repo and reverse repo transactions collateralized by Treasury securities be cleared, and then also IDB cash trades be cleared, and it directs uh, covered clearing agencies of Treasury securities, of which FIC is currently the only one, to promulgate rules implementing the Treasury clearing rule. Um, and we've been engaged on those FIC rules and have submitted responses to a package of, of three of those rules and then a, a fourth that came at, at a later date. 
Uh, and we await the SEC's decisions there uh, in terms of how it wants to proceed with those rules. And then, of course, in the meantime, uh, ICE and CME have both announced that they plan to enter this market. So we'll be very interested to see uh, what their uh, clearing offerings look like, and hopefully they can be a bit more uh, buy side uh, friendly than, than certainly the thick uh, 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 rule set that, that is currently in place and then what has been proposed implementing the Treasury rule. The Another uh, thing to put on folks' radar <clears throat> last week, the CFTC, which we haven't talked about much, mm. but the Commodity Futures Trading Commission adopted changes to their Part 4 rules, specifically Part 4.7. And this was a, I think, a rule that came out uh, in a very good way. It was when it was proposed, it kind of had a, a PFAR light version, so to speak, of mandating uh, very extensive granular disclosures that you know, our members and other uh, sophisticated parties provide to their you know, quote unquote institutional investors um, and really without much justification. Uh, the rule was very uh, there wasn't much justification, uh, to put it frankly, behind proposing what they did, these new disclosures uh, for what's called uh, 4.7 CPOs and CTAs. The final rule that was adopted seriatim, which means without an open meeting, um, did not include those disclosures. They adopted a change to the QEP uh, threshold, but otherwise kind of scrapped those disclosures, which we thought was a very good outcome uh, and quote a, somewhat of a, a win for 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 industry in that case. So Daniel, I, I started the episode by referencing a relatively quiet summer compared mm -hmm. to the whirlwind summer you had last year uh, and for the industry at large. But things have certainly heated up since then. And as you've mentioned, we do have the U.S. elections awaiting us. Uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, you've talked a little bit about it, but uh, if I could put you on the spot a little bit, what are your thoughts about how a new administration could potentially change the regulatory landscape? I, I think it's, if, if it goes one way and Donald Trump is elected president again, <clears throat> then we're going to probably see a very, the pendulum swing back a good yeah. bit from where it has been the past four years, mm. excuse me, particularly with the uh, the agencies that we engage with, like the SEC, um, if it is a Harris uh, administration, could we expect more of the same? Perhaps. I think it'll be very interesting to see what uh, Chair Gensler decides to do, um, yeah. whether he decides to stick around through the end of his term um, or exit uh, as the new administration comes in. It'll, it'll be very interesting in, in all of the polling now seems it's like it's going to be a toss-up. It could go either way with, mm. um, you know, either candidate. And then you're kind of looking at, from a legislation standpoint, what happens in Congress. It seems like the Republicans will likely take us probably a two or three seat majority in the Senate. The House uh, is anybody's guess, but it's, I think, trending the Democrats way to, to take uh, control again. So if all of that does come to fruition, we're likely to see a you know, divided government. Um, when there's divided government, there's even less done that is <laughs> that is done when the, all of the part mm -hmm. all of the uh, both houses of Congress and the presidency are controlled by uh, the same party. So I think there's going to be a significant impact on uh, certainly if it's a, a Trump presidency, the the rulemaking agenda outstanding litigation enforcement um it just remains to be seen and we just i think we have seven weeks i said earlier seven weeks yeah election so of course after then there's a lame duck period but inauguration mm -hmm. day in, in late january and then after that you know back down the hatches i guess yeah who <laughs> knows who knows um well perhaps we can check in with you then later in the year uh once the world finds out who the next U.S. President-elect will be, and and to what extent the ramifications will be on our industry. But for now, Daniel, thanks so much for taking your time to speak to us. Uh, we will add in the show notes all the various references that you made to in terms of those uh, two proposals or those two legal challenges, rather, that AMA is 
uh, working on as well as the various other uh, proposals and issues that AMA is involved in in the US and globally. Big shout out to you and to the team right across uh, the US and, and globally in terms of all the work that we do on behalf of the industry. But thank you very much for your time today, Daniel, and we'll speak to you again later in the year. Of course, Todd. Good to be with you.